Um, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, being here today. It's a pleasure to come to FNB. Um, I've uh, uh, done a lot of work over the last few years for lots of banks, and strangely enough, FNB, not that much. So it's nice to be here and speak to you, especially because I'm sort of part of FNB in a small way, you know, uh, through RMB and RMI and Alpha Code. So um, it's nice to be able to come here as well. Um, so uh, just a quick uh, a, a bit of background on, on uh, my life and what I've been doing. Um, I, I'm a software engineer by background. That's what I've been doing for the last 20 years, uh, working, doing work for banks uh, like yours, um, building technology and payment systems and all that sort of thing. And then about uh, seven years ago, I became interested in Bitcoin. And uh, since that time, for over the last seven years, all I've been doing and focusing on is trying to figure out how you know, we can realize all these amazing uh, opportunities that people keep saying are there uh, in terms of blockchain and, and all this decentralized tech. Uh, you know, I've done uh, many POCs for many uh, uh, institutions. I've, done, uh, uh, I've been training many banks, many organizations. I've, I co-founded the Blockchain Academy, um, and uh, I'm working on Bitcoin tech right now. So um, also done, I, I don't even know how many countless talks for organizations, both locally and internationally. Uh, just last week, I was at the UN and I gave a presentation on, on blockchain opportunities for Africa. So this is something that I've been uh, uh, very much involved with. Uh, it's my passion and I've been doing it for many, many years. And I really do believe that there are amazing opportunities in this space. Um, but uh, they're not apparent. I think that there's uh, so much hype around how blockchain can disintermediate and disrupt so much. And I think that a lot of that is just hype. Uh, I don't think that it's going to be something quite like that. Although the internet, when it first came along, was very much this, this strange, mysterious technology that we thought was going to be amazing, but we had no idea. We had no idea how the internet was going to turn out back in the 90s. None of us would have imagined that we would all have the internet in our pockets. And basically every aspect of our lives uh, would have the internet woven into it. If you just think about the way you now uh, interact with people, how you express yourself, how you communicate, how you buy things, uh, you, you know, everything that you do just about nowadays is on the internet. It's not even about a mobile phone being there for talking. It's almost like a, a mobile device is an internet machine which, which has a, a voice feature. We don't think of phones anymore as just being something you talk on. You know, it's now how you, you, how you actually access the internet and how you can actually function in this modern world. So blockchain is kind of like that. You know, it's the sort of idea, this uh, novel thing that uh, uh, looks interesting. Uh, it certainly allows us to do things we could never do before. But we don't know where it's going to go. We don't know how it's going to turn out. So there's ma uh, much investment, many people talking about blockchain, uh, lots of different companies trying to build out tech in this. And they all say that they've got the next big thing which is going to disrupt insurance or banking or this or that, uh, identity, uh, land title, government. You know, there's just so much going on that people are exploring that uh, it's kind of difficult to see at this point which of those things are going to turn out to be Yes, truly uh, 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 disruptive, or how much of it is hype? Remember, the internet was a lot of hype as well. Although, you know, it, uh, the, the hype was kind of realized, if you think about it. A lot of the, the tech companies that died in 2000, they kind of are here with us today. You know, uh, there was a famous one called Pets.com, and they, uh, uh, they were a big uh, dot-com uh, bust story. But uh, nowadays, you know, buying pet food on the internet, nobody would even think twice about that. I don't do that myself, you know, but uh, uh, it's obviously uh, viable. I mean, especially with Amazon, you know, being these, like, these same day, uh, very low uh, uh, fee, uh, low delivery cost uh, uh, portals where you can buy stuff. I mean, buying stuff online now is just, you know, it's just a no brainer. I mean, if you think about Uber Eats, you know, I used Uber Eats last night. So what are the opportunities that that face us? What do, what do I think that uh, are, are the things that maybe are more likely than not? And that's why I've titled this presentation, The Immediate Opportunities in Blockchain. Uh, uh, you know, because of course there's long-term ideas, you know, we're all investigating those, but what could you do right now? Especially as a bank. You know, a, a bank is a, a one of those, those, those institutions that people are all saying that Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrency is going to completely disintermediate. And in fact, I've even said things like that in the past. I've said, you know, banks have like five years uh, to go. And that was probably two years ago when I said that. So I've got three years to check. But uh, to be honest, I don't think it's banks really that are going to be uh, that much disrupted in terms of this technology. I think central banks, for sure. You know, the idea of, a, of a, a, a kind of currency that is not governed and, and issued by a central bank, that is a, a very real uh, application of uh, this kind of technology. But as far as the others, 
maybe less so. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to now talk us through, I'm going to uh, uh, walk us through why I, what I think is interesting, what I think is important, and I think what is relevant to you. And uh, uh, then you can now go from here and you can make your own decision. Uh, uh, I'm just going to give you what I think, being in the space for so long, and having worked with so many different organizations and having investigated and pursued so many different ideas, you know, uh, I'm starting to get a feel for maybe what is imminent and what is not. So I'm going to try and share that with you. And you're going to start seeing that I'm going to have a very, I'm going to be focusing on one specific aspect of blockchain that I think is, is, uh, is really here today and uh, uh, has a, a great you know, a potential to change all of our lives, whether you are looking at it from a professional point of view or from a personal point of view. Okay, so let's just uh, uh, quickly uh, narrow down or at least uh, uh, categorize the three aspects of this technology that I'm going to now talk about because it's not just one thing. Uh, obviously, uh, blockchain is basically the, the kind of foundation of where everything is going to be built upon. Think about it, it, blockchain being the internet. And then we have these other things. Uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin being the most uh, uh, famous and most widespread uh, one today, but there are obviously many different kinds of cryptocurrencies. And then this idea of tokens, because uh, tokens are, are very interesting. Uh, yes, uh, there certainly looks like there could be disruption there, but uh, again, you know, you know, there's going to be a lot of time from a regulatory point of view and also from a technical point of view before the idea of these tokens, and I'm going to explain to you what tokens mean and what they represent uh, a little bit, uh, and then I'm going to focus on, on the one aspect that I, I think is the most uh, important, and that's cryptocurrency. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to just quickly describe, I'm going to give you a quick blockchain 101, I'm going to explain to you what it is so you all become experts, and then I'm going to start narrowing down on what I think is useful and important. Okay, so you ready for this? Okay, so blockchain is, is extremely easy to understand. I know that you've probably sat with people and they've tried to explain blockchain and it's become crazy uh, and you don't know what they've been talking about, but let me explain to you, it's really, really easy. And the fact that you guys work in a bank makes it even 10 times easier. It means that you are way ahead of the curve already. All right, so if this is our bank, and let's say this is your bank over here, you know that you, your bank has ledgers and it has uh, databases, and in those databases you've got records, you've got accounts, you've got uh, uh, people that you've uh, listed in those uh, 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 databases, and those accounts have balances. Now, if you understand this part about uh, the way your organization works, well, then you're 90% of the way to understanding how blockchain works. So when uh, somebody wants to go and actually make a transaction, uh, they want to go and pay for something at a merchant, what they've got to do is they present their credit card. But now money's not flying from that credit card to that merchant. What happens is the customer is sending an instruction to the bank and saying to the bank, please can you debit money out of my account and go and credit the merchant's account. Okay, so that is pretty much what you live and work with and uh, what you understand, right? So if you, if you understand this, you're 90% 90, 90 of the way there. So imagine this now. Imagine instead of a bank holding this ledger, we get rid of the bank. So there is no organization or, or authority that's now governing that ledger. And instead, what we do is we get all these volunteers all around the world, and they all take a copy, an exact copy of that ledger. And what they do now is they work together to make sure that that ledger is kept in sync. And uh, every time somebody wants to make a transaction, what happens is they go and instead of sending the message to the bank, they just broadcast it to this network over here, and then all these computers work together to make sure that the right uh, um, numbers are debited from the right accounts, and so on. And the most important thing about this, if you, ha if you can see by now, is that it's a, a decentralized system. Now, that's one of the most important words to think about whenever somebody says blockchain to you. And what they're actually saying is they're saying decentralization. Now, obviously, if you think about your, the way your bank works, you don't have a decentralized organization here. Sure, you cooperate with many banks around the world and many merchants and many payment systems, but at the end of the day, you are responsible and you are uh, the, um, the custodians of a single uh, uh, view on the data or a single source of data. You are, the, 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 you are centralizing that information within your organization. So when somebody says blockchain, what they're saying is taking away that power for you to be able to govern that ledger and distribute it around to whomever and make sure that none of those actors or those participants in this network have more control than the next. This must be a completely decentralized network. So what we have now is we've got this big global network of volunteers. We don't even know who they are. 
and uh, they are all hosting copies of this ledger. And whenever you make a transaction, you're now sending a message out to this network, and they are now making sure the ledger is kept in sync. That is what a blockchain is. Okay. So now, when it comes to a specific blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, what we have is we now have this big global bank that's not run or governed or controlled by any single authority or single organization. It's this big decentralized bank. Quite an incredible idea. But obviously, this can extend into other things. When I talk about tokens, you're going to see how uh, this doesn't have to be bitcoins. It doesn't have to be numbers. Uh, at the end of the day, it's just a number, and you give that number a name. The numbers we give to our, uh, the numbers in our banks we call RANDs. But uh, here we have bitcoins. But we could call those numbers other things. Maybe what we could do is we could uh, give those little uh, tokens that are now floating around on this big network identities that represent other things, like maybe uh, 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 an asset, like a house or a car or something like that. Okay, so this is what we have. And uh, if you got this far, you are now already, again, an expert in, in blockchain. It's now a ledger that is distributed and decentralized around the world. And we now have this big global uh, 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 system that now manages and, and everybody keeps in uh, a consensus what information is on that ledger. Okay. And uh, by the way, why is it called a blockchain if you were wondering? Well, what happens in a blockchain is that every few minutes or so in Bitcoin, it's every 10 minutes, groups of transactions are collected together. So every time somebody makes a transaction, what happens is those transactions are grouped together into a block and then they are processed and the ledger is updated with that block of transactions. And then 10 minutes goes by, and another block of transactions gets created, and it gets linked together with the last block until we have this chain of blocks of transactions. And that's why it's called a blockchain. All right, are you experts now? Okay, now you can impress your friends at cocktail parties and things with your, with your amazing knowledge. Okay, so obviously there are many, many different kinds of blockchains, and I'm sure that you've heard some of them. Uh, there are some like Ethereum, which is the most famous one, and, and a host of others. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, look, we are now going to take this decentralized idea, and we're going to try and decentralize every aspect of your life, or everything that you work with. We're going to try and create a decentralized version of that. So think about marketplaces and um, think, you know, where you buy stuff. Think about uh, uh, services, you know, uh, things, uh, fun things that you do, social networks or um, even casinos or something like that. All these blockchains that are being created today are all trying to take the idea of decentralization and they're trying to turn an, an old industry from a centralized one owned by Facebook or owned by Amazon and create a decentralized version of that. Now, we don't know whether or not that's a good idea for, for many of those uh, instances. In some instances, it is cool. And uh, you're going to find out soon enough that there are actually uh, systems that are running today, like decentralized marketplaces, where it's like eBay, but there is no eBay running behind it. And it's all now operating off these blockchains. Okay. So let me now talk about the tokens. I'm going to just touch on the tokens, then I'm, then I'm going to now move into the cryptocurrency, and I'm going to paint a picture of why cryptocurrencies are so important. And in fact, uh, creates an opportunity for a bank like yours, especially an innovative tech bank like yours. All right, but let's first talk about the token aspect, and you're going to see the kinds of things that people are thinking about tokenizing uh, and why it's actually such a cool idea. So first of all, um, one of the, 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 the obvious uh, tokens that you get are the currencies. And so something like Bitcoin or Litecoin or, or um, uh, Monero or whatever, you know, those are, are currency tokens. And people can now issue those tokens according to whatever rules they have built into the, blo uh, the blockchain that they have. So Bitcoin has uh, 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 coded into it certain rules. For example, uh, every 10 minutes, whenever a block is created, 12 Bitcoins or 12 and a half Bitcoins get created in the system. And every four years or so, that, that supply is halved. And then eventually, we're going to get to 21 million. And that's all the tokens that are ever going to exist in Bitcoin land. But other, to other blockchains have different sorts of rules. And it all comes down to what rules you want in that system. Okay. So the first one is the currency aspect. Then the second one is the utility token. Now, when I say a utility token, um, every time you use a service, uh, let's say you want to now um, uh, use a service and one of the famous uh, utility tokens that exists today, and it's a South African, Vinnie Lingham, who created a company called Civic. 
what he's trying to do is he's trying to create the ability for people like ourselves to have our identity information, so our name and surname and uh, our address and all that sort of thing. What we do is we keep that information ourselves. It's not hosted on any server out there that can get hacked and, and all that information can get lost. And then what we do is we use the civic platform to create tokens that then can be used to then uh, 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 validate our identity. So this is now a way that you can use tokens. You can use it as a sort of fuel to be able to run a system. All right, that's one of the other aspects of tokens. And Civic is a good example of a utility token. Um, then there's equity. Now, uh, if you've ever heard of the term ICO, or initial coin offering, now, uh, you know, nowadays it's more likely an insane clown offering. But uh, ICOs are, are, are huge right now. Everybody wants to create an ICO, an initial coin offering, where what they say is they say, we want to raise money for an idea. And what we're going to do is we're going to issue these tokens, these coins, and basically what's going to happen is uh, you can buy these coins from us and we will take that money and then we will use that money to build out this product that you believe in. And then one day when this product is live and it's very valuable, people will start trading those tokens and that, those tokens will grow in value and then you have this sort of, some sort of asset. Now obviously that, that is a little bit confusing for most people, it's a bit hard to understand and uh, I think ICOs are taking advantage of a very sort of unsophisticated market right now and that's why we have these enormous valuations for these ICOs. Um, but certainly uh, 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 equity, where what you can do is you can actually buy equity in a company through an ICO, that is a novel idea. And that really sort of disrupts the whole idea of venture capitalists and all that sort of thing. And maybe this one day will be the way that uh, many companies are funded. They're talking about equity tokens as being you know, something that's really going to allow uh, businesses that would never have access to VC money uh, in the past, maybe what they can do is now they can offer equity to the crowd. Now obviously that's, there's a lot of you know, legal and regulatory aspects around that. You know, if you're issuing equity, you've got to know who owns that equity. Um, you know, uh, but, uh, so maybe there's some kinks to be worked out here. Um, and then finally, the asset token, where, like I said before, you can actually now create uh, 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 tokens that represent assets, or maybe shares of assets. For example, your house. You know, right now, uh, when you buy a house, what you do is you, 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 you uh, get, sell a bond to the bank, and you take money, uh, and then you buy, and now you have to, uh, what you have to do over, the, over, the, over several years is you've got to pay that loan back. Now, imagine if you could, instead of getting a loan, what you could do is you could buy equity in your house. So you buy, you know, uh, every month, you, instead, of, instead of paying back your loan, what you're doing is you're actually just buying more shares in your house. And then one day what you could do is maybe you could start selling shares of your, of your house. So um, uh, asset tokens are also very interesting, where we can now create physical real-world assets that are linked to these tokens, and those tokens represent ownership of that asset. And then you can now be able to have a very liquid asset to, to be able to easily exchange uh, uh, instead of having just a house sitting there that's hard to move, you know, if you want to sell your house, you can start selling equity in your house or whatever it is, or whatever other asset there is. So the whole idea of now tokenizing assets, tokenizing equity, tokenizing currencies, and tokenizing uh, uh, access to your platform, this is going to be perhaps another interesting thing around what blockchain can do for us. Um, uh, again, this is now uh, probably further down the line, but maybe here's an opportunity for a bank like yours to be able to start thinking in terms of, of these tokens, and, uh, and uh, especially when it comes to the assets, perhaps. But um, what I want to do now is I want to focus on, and I'm going to spend the rest of the time, uh, you might think I'm putting too much emphasis on the cryptocurrency aspect, but as a bank, you deal with money. So uh, I think it's, it's a pertinent dis uh, discussion to have. And also, it's something that I really genuinely believe is the, what we're missing you know, in terms of this whole blockchain thing. You know, uh, it, it's been there's so much excitement over the last few years and so much investment into blockchain tech, decentralizing all these different services, that we've forgotten that the whole point about this was, uh, was about the cryptocurrency. Um, you know, um, uh, when, uh, uh, when cryptocurrency was created, there were very specific things going on in the real world, which I'm going to talk about, that, uh, uh, that, that this idea of Bitcoin was meant to solve. But uh, you know, uh, the idea of a money that is issued by, not issued by a central bank, that's not governed by a government or a central bank, is obviously very politically incorrect. And uh, if uh, you start saying, listen, I want to use bitcoins instead of rands, you know, I want to earn bitcoins and I want to spend bitcoins, suddenly you know, SARS and you know, the, the FIC and everybody, they're going to start saying, whoa, 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 what's happening here? Suddenly we don't have any visibility in what's going on. You know, you're now moving huge amounts of money out of the country. That's a big uh, capital flight uh, risk for us. You know, uh, of course, uh, the idea of, of a currency like this, uh, a 
private currency, a private meaning that, it's, that, you, know, that you can do with it what you like and no one's ever going to know, is of course is a very scary idea. Um, but uh, uh, the great thing is, and this is what I've been do doing right now, I, I deal, uh, work very closely with the Saab, you know, because obviously the Saab uh, uh, Reserve Bank are, are, are interested in this, they're, you know, they, they, they're concerned about these sorts of problems, um, and they want to know, you know, is this an issue they have to deal with. But um, the amazing thing about the Reserve Bank, and this is why I love our Reserve Bank, uh, uh, is that they are very open to the idea of a currency like this. If it can genuinely provide benefits to people, if it can make the world a better place, you know, I've been uh, stunned to find that, uh, that, that there are actually human beings working at the Reserve Bank, and they genuinely have interest in making the world a better place. They want to make the country a better place. So even though uh, I'm going to talk about why central banks are evil, um, I'm pleased to know uh, to, and to inform you that uh, uh, central banks do have, uh, uh, they don't just have this kind of, at least ours, I mean obviously there are other central banks with different opinions, but uh, our central bank is quite open to the idea that if this can solve issues, if this can create opportunities for people who don't have access to existing uh, banking systems, and you know there are many uh, up in Africa, less so in South Africa, if this can really solve problems, great. We are, they are open to, to uh, uh, acknowledging and accepting it and allowing it to exist but as long as they feel that they're not completely out of the loop. So what I've been doing with them is, is uh, showing them that there are many aspects about this that make it quite uh, and reasonably controllable, at least oversightable, if that's a word, where something they can have oversight and uh, a little bit of governance in terms of what happens in this space. So it's not just a wild west where you know, you're going to suddenly have this world uh, where terrorists and money launderers and drug dealers are going to be overrunning everything and we're not going to ever be able to stamp them out. This is a space that can be regulated. It can, there can be oversight. There can be controls. The government doesn't have to feel that they are at risk over here. And uh, that means that more and more people are going to start getting into it. And my own uh, business, uh, I have another company called uh, Centby, which is all about trying to make Bitcoin usable and accessible and uh, allow one day you all, and I hope one day you do, and uh, maybe in a few years' time I can uh, get a survey, that you will want to be using my app to go buy your groceries at Pick and Pay or Woolworths, and you'll be able to uh, uh, send it you know, to your relatives or do whatever you want with it. That's my goal. I want to make Bitcoin uh, accessible and usable to you, to you all. Okay. So um, let me now uh, launch into this whole story of why I think the way I do, why I think it's so important. And this is the immediate opportunity for a bank like yours. And this is what you should be focusing on. Obviously, uh, there are the other uh, interesting ideas, but this is a good one. This is a very cool one that you guys can explore. Okay, so where it comes down now. Uh, let me tell you a quick a little story. Um, why uh, one of the reasons and why uh, you know uh, Bitcoin is so cool and so important, and it kind of revolves around this. This uh, WikiLeaks. I'm sure you know about WikiLeaks. Now I'm not an anarchist, okay, but uh, I like there being this idea of freedom of information. I think that information is good. You know, it's good to know what's going on, especially by uh, the rich and powerful, whatever they're doing out there. I want to know what's what's happening. If there's anything you know going on. And uh, I think WikiLeaks is a good organization, and I'm pleased that they exist. But uh, uh, WikiLeaks, as, a, as an organization, um, they uh, uh, depend on donations and funding, just like any other organization. Now, a couple of years back, uh, this was probably about 20, maybe it was 2011 or so, 2010, I can't remember. Um, what happened was uh, suddenly uh, 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 the government, uh, the American, everybody started clamping down on WikiLeaks. They obviously started uh, feeling a little bit that you know too many secrets out there is not a great thing for uh, uh, governance and all that sort of thing. So what they did was they basically uh, banned all these payment companies from being able to provide a service to, to WikiLeaks. And that meant WikiLeaks was not allowed to accept payments through any channel, essentially. And so what WikiLeaks did, this was way back in the day, is that they said, oh, fine, we're going to accept Bitcoin. Now, this is the, 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 one of the most important things about uh, uh, Bitcoin that, uh, um, again, uh, coming from an existing legacy traditional point of view, you know, you think, uh, 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 you might think differently, but the most important thing about Bitcoin is what's called uncensor, uncensorable payments. The ability for somebody to make a payment to somebody else without anybody getting in the way. Now, WikiLeaks to me is a good example because, again, my philosophy in life is that WikiLeaks should exist. And if WikiLeaks wants to raise money to be able to um, you know, provide information to, to us or to me, they should be allowed to receive uh, funding. So Bitcoin came along and said, fine, we're going to pro provide funding. And WikiLeaks uh, did, uh, managed to survive because of Bitcoin, thank goodness. So this is one of the most important things about why Bitcoin 
is important. It allows you to not have, uh, 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 like somebody being able to say, we are going to decide who you're allowed to make payments to. And that to me is a, an important thing about uh, life. You might have a different opinion, but to me this is one of the most important things. But second of all, and uh, um, this is probably going to touch some of you if you guys are, are from Zimbabwe, but it's this, the $100 trillion note. Now, I don't know how many of you remember uh, back in 2009 when these were being created. It was a big joke, um, you know, because you were spending hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, on a couple eggs and some bread and all that sort of thing. But this is a genuine issue in the world. This idea of the, the idea that a, a currency can hyperinflate and become worthless. Now, we are all in a, in a world where, you know, we're starting to get hints of, of being downgraded again, junk status, you know, interest rates going up and all this, uh, this uh, kind of financial turmoil. And uh, we, we hope, we know uh, many South Africans have this hope that uh, we're not going to become like Zimbabwe. You know, a lot of South Africans who leave South Africa, they, they say they leave because they fear that South Africa is just going to become like Zimbabwe. It's going to be, uh, you know, uh, there's going to be a dictator and they're going to destroy the currency and basically ruin us financially. But uh, this is not just an outlier. You know, Zimbabwe wasn't just this one instance where suddenly, you know, those central bankers decided to make some stu stupid decisions and then destroyed their currency and, and ruined financially millions of people in Zim. This is actually an issue that comes up in a, a time and time again. Now, uh, this was the 56th time a currency has hyperinflated in the world. And do you know what? There's a 57th. Do you know what that is? Venezuela. Venezuela is also hyperinflating its currency. Um, let's just quickly look at a chart because I know you bankers and you love charts. This is what the, the, the supply of currency looked like in Zimbabwe up until 2009. Clearly, hyperinflation. By the way, hyperinflation doesn't mean prices going up. It means a rapid increase in the supply of money. That's the definition. And then it eventually, uh, uh, the symptoms of hyperinflation are increasing the prices of assets or, or like our consumer prices. And so obviously now through all this rapid increase in supply of the currency, it was eventually translated into prices and we started seeing prices in Zim going up. And it's happening in, in uh, Venezuela uh, today. But there was another issue, 2008. Do you remember 2008? Um, this was a, a significant time for uh, the world. Uh, it wasn't just an American thing, but the, the global financial crisis where all banks, uh, a lot of banks, a lot of financial organizations were loaning money to people that shouldn't have had those loans, the subprime. And what happened was those loans went bad, and uh, uh, those banks basically became insolvent. A lot of people became insolvent, because all those, uh, if, if you've ever watched uh, The Big Short, then you'll know this whole story. Um, and uh, what happened was now these banks became insolvent. And uh, uh, how did they survive? Obviously, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, they didn't, but uh, uh, you know, it wasn't just those banks that were at risk. So how, how, did, uh, the, 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 how did the banks uh, stay alive? Well, uh, the central banks came into the rescue. And uh, what happened was, and now we're going back to a chart uh, of the US money supply, uh, there's a famous uh, quote called jumping the shark. Have you ever heard of that? It's, it, it means uh, whenever you do something random, completely you know, uh, 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 strange and, and, and unlikely. But uh, what happened was, in 2008, uh, boom, we had all these, uh, this is the US money supply, we had all these rounds of quantitative easing, quantitative easing one, two, and then there was Operation Twist, uh, there was all these troubled asset uh, recovery program type, I can't remember, I think that was a, what it was called. But basically the US dollar hyperinflated. Now the US dollar is the world reserve currency. And um, uh, uh, obviously whatever happens to the dollar surely must happen to, uh, and flow into the rest of the world. Now the dollar is an amazing currency because you know, they can print as much as they like, but because the world needs dollars to buy oil and that sort of thing, uh, all that uh, inflation is uh, exported. Okay, so if you now go and look at uh, tradingeconomics.com, it's a great website. What happens is they list all these sort of uh, financial statistics like GDP and interest rates and money supply um, and all that sort of thing, trading economics. When you go and look at trading economics and you go look at any country, the supply of currency, you're going to start seeing that uh, that same picture, hyperinflation, has happened around the world. So there's China. And uh, do you want to have a look at what South Africa looks like? Boom. That is our own currency. Now, People will say, okay, okay, Lauren, I get it. I get that, uh, you know, according to the money supply that uh, there's been all this hyperinflation, but where is it? Why don't I, why am I not paying 100 billion Rand for uh, my groceries? Um, where's all that hyperinflation gone? 
Well, have you guys looked at the stock markets around the world lately? If you go look at the Venezuelan stock market, by the way, it, is, it looks basically like that. It's on this amazing hockey stick. But who wants to be in the Venezuelan stock market, uh, you know, where the currency is basically worth nothing? So where's all the inflation gone? Well, if you go and look at uh, 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 bank balance sheets, central bank balance sheets, and you go and correlate that against uh, the MCSI, which is a global stock index, you see that all this inflation has been going into asset prices, into uh, stock markets, and so on. We've been in this incredible bull run since 2008. Go look at the Dow Jones. Go look at the S&P 500. Um, go look at any stock market. And you'll see that all that money that has now gone into the system hasn't gone into the economy and so into your groceries, but has gone into your assets. So if you are holding stock, if you're holding assets, you know, right now you're feeling pretty wealthy. And that was the whole idea these central banks thought, that, you know, that what they can do is they can create, this, create the wealth effect where hopefully all that value, uh, uh, wealth trickles down to the rest of us. But it hasn't. It's gone into this. And by the way, if you're still not uh, convinced that, uh, that uh, central bank money that has been printed has gone into the stock market, here's some stats for you. Uh, the Swiss central bank owns more shares in Facebook than Mark Zuckerberg. Um, the Bank of Japan is the number one shareholder. This is a bit old. In the top 88 companies, I think it's now more. It's the top, 100, uh, top 100. And then I just recently heard Bank of Norway owns $55 billion of stock in Facebook. Now, the $55 billion, And uh, what is Facebook? Right? I mean, uh, uh, Apple? It's about uh, 800 billion, uh, 900 billion. So it's a significant chunk of Facebook's value is actually a central bank owned. So banks aren't just holding mortgages and all that sort of thing, central banks. They're holding private stock, private equity in businesses. They're buying up the stock market. So this is clearly a bad situation that's going to end badly for all of us. Because we are now in a global financial system. Uh, we, you know, uh, it's all tied together. Uh, our, our central bank is no more immune from this uh, than any other. And we are going to be looking at a hyperinflationary collapse, perhaps coming in the next few months, maybe not uh, even in the next few years. Um, and also, you know, if you just think about uh, the purchasing price of rands and dollars and so on, you know, uh, uh, I'm sure you can remember when you were kids um, how much pocket money you got. Uh, uh, not to give away my age, but I was earning about 20 cents a, a week back in those days. It wasn't much then, but I mean, it was enough for a, a seven-year-old. And, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, 20 cents could get you, you know, a couple, a handful of sweets and uh, some good times. Um, so what can, seven cent, uh, what can 20 cents get you today? Obviously nothing, literally nothing. And if we go look at the best currency in the world, the US dollar, you know, the currency that I guess all of us wish we got paid in, this is what the purchasing power looks like since 20, uh, 1913, which is when the central bank Federal Reserve was created. So it's lost 98% of its value in, that, in the last 100 years. And that last 2% is probably going to be happening soon. Okay. So we definitely live in a world where the money that, that exists today, it just doesn't seem likely that it's going to persist. And uh, uh, you know, I don't have any slides. I have another presentation. By the way, if you want uh, deeper presentations on this, I've got a YouTube channel. If you go and just type in Laurie and Gamroff in YouTube, you'll find my channel. Um, I've, I've started listing all, a lot of the talks that I've been giving. And there's one that I give which shows you, um, you know, uh, uh, a lot more about uh, these sorts of things. Um, but it looks like that, uh, 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 this is what I want to say, was that um, you know, uh, financial systems don't last forever. You know, uh, there's generally about a, a 45 years, 40, 45 years cycle for a financial system. If you think about 45 years ago, uh, or 1971, I don't know how many years, 46 years ago or so. 1971 was when the world went off the gold standard and we had this new financial system, what was called this fiat system, the first system we have today where money is just paper, literally printed you know, on, out, of, out of thin air. Um, uh, before that, it was the Bretton Woods where the world was sort of on a gold standard and so on and so on. Well, it looks kind of like we're heading into a time where there's going to be some kind of reset, a new kind of financial system coming along. And it looks at this stage that it might be a kind of uh, uh, IMF, a special drawing right type system. Special drawing right is the name of the currency that the IMF has. Um, and once uh, central banks need to ba be bailed out, because the banks were bailed out in 2008, now the central banks need to be bailed out, it's probably going to be with an SDR uh, from an IMF, from the IMF, which means that there's going to be a huge financial turmoil when this transition happens. It's not like you're going to get one for one, you know, in your rands. Okay. Also, you know, we live in a, an incredible time because of 2008. This is just the Fed fund rate. This is the U.S. dollar. I'm, I'm focusing on the U.S. dollar because obviously it's the, the, the de facto reserve currency. Uh, in the last eight years, uh, since 2008, we've been on this incredibly low interest rate policy, you know, uh, unprecedented in history. Um, uh, in fact, even some uh, banks around the world have negative interest rates. Can you believe it that such a thing can exist? It makes no sense. 
So um, if you just think about financially the world as it is today, the money that we have today, we, you know, we have short histories, our memories don't go back very far, we think that whatever is today is going to be here forever, but if you just look at history, you study economics, you look at these basic charts, you don't have to be an economist to get, get what I'm saying, that things are changing. There is going to be something that is going to come along that is going to disrupt us all again, possibly a Zimbabwe, a global Zimbabwe uh, type uh, situation. Okay. But there's so much more. I mean, I've just given you kind of the, the, the whole idea of these fiat currency issues. Um, you know, um, okay, I mentioned the negative interest rate policy that is in some uh, banks around the world. Um, but there's also this idea of bank bail-ins. Uh, I think I just accidentally skipped. Let me just go back to that. So, um, you know, there's now policies in some banks around the world that if, like in Cyprus, in, uh, when was it, a few years ago, you know, if the bank gets into trouble, uh, you know, you can take money out of depositors' accounts. Not, not temporarily, but actually take money out of their accounts. There's this whole idea of the war on cash. Uh, just think about India a couple years ago, a year ago, um, when uh, uh, suddenly they decided to demonetize uh, money. And uh, in fact, every bank, every central bank, wants to move into digital payments. Uh, obviously, it's more convenient. You know, printing coins and notes, creating, it's inefficient. You don't have visibility on transactions. Being in a completely digital world, where every transaction is, is, uh, has oversight and every transaction can have a fee. I'm sure you guys would love that. Uh, this is the world that we are definitely moving into. But a lot of people have the sort of resistance against that. You know, um, the ability now uh, to have private transactions is moving. We're moving away from that, where one day you won't be able to just pay uh, uh, with, with paper money uh, uh, to, to some, so something. You know? So, so every, uh, every uh, transaction in your, in your life is going to be governed and controlled uh, and uh, uh, there's going to be a fee involved and there's going to be you know, some kind of uh, governance around that. Um, capital flight, you know, capital controls. We know that in China there's a big drive. People want to move money out of that as they devalue the yuan. To, to move money out of it. Then we got the unbanked. You know, so many people in, uh, in, uh, in Africa are unbanked. I think 80% of the World Bank, uh, the numbers are still correct. Um, how much, ge and geopolitical uncertainty and risk. Just think about uh, Syria, think about North Korea. You know, there's a lot of instability in the world today in terms of finance. So people are now looking for alternatives, and people are starting to talk about gold standards, going back to what's called an Austrian economic uh, system, you know, where money is gold, where central banks can't just create money out of thin air in this Keynesian world that we live today, because um, obviously it leads to, to problems, you know, having all this hyperinflation. So as you can see here, the money issue, and this is why Bitcoin was created, was because of the fact that our banks, central banks, are basically uh, uh, have uh, kind of just gone off the rails and have started creating this uh, very clear path to financial destruct destruction. And this is where it all started. This is where blockchain came from. It wanted to create a financial system that was not under the control of a central bank, which has time and time again proven to not have the ability to safely uh, uh, be a, the, 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 the driver or the, um, the, the custodian or whatever it is of, of our money. And this is the feeling that people are having around the world. Maybe not with you, but um, certainly in, in other countries. If you just go and look at them, you go look at Venezuela, you go look at many other countries, and they're, they're not even the, you know, many countries in Africa, I think Sudan is 40% inflation, you know, they're very high inflation. So people are really looking for alternatives. How do we preserve our wealth? It's not how do we make millions in the next day or two. Uh, how do we protect ourselves from the potential for another major catastrophic financial event where we are now, like Zimbabweans, basically helpless. And we have to now build ourselves up from the ground again. It's happening even, even today. Okay, more than that, if you think about money moving around the world, um, remittance, the cost of remittance, um, you know, uh, Africa is the, if you try to move money from South Africa, it's the, one of the most expensive countries to move money. In fact, the most expensive corridors are in Africa, the top uh, most expensive. Obviously, there are uh, little uh, fintechs that are coming along now trying to bring that down. You know, we have uh, a cool fintechs in South Africa, we get 5%, 6% or whatever. But, um, and by the way, um, Nedbank is the, uh, tw the 28%, I think it was. Uh, okay, so it's not you guys. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the cost of moving money is it's inconvenient, it's complicated, it takes a long time, and it's very expensive. If you just think about our own people moving money or, 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 or expats moving money from here to, to uh, other countries in Africa. So they would like an alternative as well. So you can start seeing how the idea of this digital currency that isn't controlled, you don't need a bank account, you don't need to do uh, anything, all you need is an app, 
You know, you just need, need a mobile phone. Suddenly you can now transact globally at very low cost and also with the side effect of being able to protect yourself against uh, uh, you know, this, these potential financial risks. Okay. okay, so as you can see, this is now a trend. We are moving in this direction. And whether you guys are on this train or not, uh, it makes no difference. The world is moving on. All right. Uh, I would hope that all of you start taking this seriously and don't just think about you know, the price of Bitcoin today. Obviously, you know, completely nuts, although I think it's justified. Uh, but I'm going to talk more about Bitcoin and my, what I think of its future. Um, it's not good, uh, although I'm a, I love Bitcoin. Uh, but I think the way Bitcoin is today, and I'll, I'll talk more about it, you know, maybe it, it's not doing the right thing. But certainly the price is reflecting what we're talking about. Of course, there's a lot of speculators, a lot of people moving into Bitcoin, you know, because they want to get rich. But uh, there's other aspects, as, as I explained. But now let's talk about uh, um, uh, business. Now, uh, the internet, you know, uh, once upon a time back in the 90s, now I, I, I was doing my computer science degree in the 90s, so I remember the birth of the internet. It was very exciting, you know, this idea of this decentralized network where anybody could have a voice, anybody could do anything you wanted to. You didn't have to now, you know, uh, be some company with major uh, finance behind you. You know, you could create a blog, you could create a store, you could do whatever you liked. But what happened was that the internet became very siloed. Nowadays, if you search, you probably use Google. If you're uh, on a social network, you probably have Facebook, and so on. <laughs> All right. The internet has become extremely siloed, uh, and uh, we don't have this, this uh, much choice. Um, okay. And you'll realize that a lot of this is, uh, and, and uh, of course, Uber being this, uh, what we think nowadays is this extremely innovative company. It's disrupting transport and so on, um, and potentially, um, you know, uh, this could be something that, uh, you know, in, uh, Uber is going to be here for a long time and whether, you know, taxis like it or not, uh, uh, meter taxis like it or not. But the reason why the internet has become like this, if you look into it, it always comes down to essentially the finance, the payments, the, the money that is now moving through these companies. Now, I'm going to use Uber as an example because you're going to see that Uber, at the end of the day, all it does is uh, act as a sort of glorified payment hub. You know, one of the most uh, important things about Uber is when you hail your cab and you go and get your ride, is that um, you're not having to worry about handing money over to the driver. And the driver doesn't have to worry that he's going to give you a ride and you're not going to pay him. Okay, so the, 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 most, the, the biggest and most important value proposition that Uber has is the payments aspect. Now, of course, you might say, well, hang on, Lauren, but Uber isn't like that. I mean, there's other things. You know, it, it vets the drivers and uh, maybe there's insurance and so on. But if you eliminate the finance aspect out of this Uber relationship that you have with your driver, and uh, you can now see a world where if I could now pay my driver directly, I could then have uh, access to a whole host of these decentralized service providers that all provide insurance, perhaps, or they vet drivers. And uh, uh, also remember, Uber's not an app. Apps are, you know, are, are anyone can create an app. You know, I mean, an app with, a, with, with so that's not a, a Uber's value either. So you could now have a, a decentralized Uber where you could now go and find drivers. You could see who those drivers have been vetted by. Maybe you've got preferential uh, uh, service providers that provide insurance and so on. And you can say, only show me the drivers that have been insured by this guy and have been vetted by this company. And I'm going to be able to now finance and pay my driver directly. You don't need Uber. Uber is completely irrelevant. And, uh, so, and so on with all these other sorts of services. If you think about eBay, eBay or bid or buy, you know, um, what happens is eBay lists products and then they provide this finance uh, function for you and then they, uh, they make sure that the, 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 the service provider, the, pay, the merchant gets paid and they make sure that you get your goods and so on and so on. Okay. But if you could pay the merchant or the service provider directly, again, you don't need Uber. If you can list your products in a decentralized way, why should I go and bother with Uber? Now, um, you, you think that this is all futuristic, but it's not. Every service that I've just mentioned already has a decentralized version. Arcade City is operating today, and it's a decentralized Uber. Um, Open Bazaar, you can download right now, and uh, you can now go and list your products. It's not listing it on a website. What happens is you list them on your own computer, and then it, uh, your computer links to this network of, of, of uh, other people listing their products and, and purchases. And then people can buy directly from you. Open Bazaar has nothing to do with uh, uh, that payment function. I don't know what their business model is. They are raising money, but uh, that's how it is. So can you see how when you can pay somebody directly without having to go through a bank or something like that, you can eliminate a lot of uh, uh, the, the way that the, the companies exist today. Now, what does that mean for you? I mean, I'm sure you guys are thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you just say payments without banks? Of course, that's your worst nightmare. 
you know, obviously you perform other functions other than just making facilitating payments, but uh, uh, that's pretty important to you. So what can you do in this space? This is something that you're going to have to think about, you know, because one day I'm going to be quite happy instead of using Amazon.com to use Open Bazaar or uh, uh, Steemit. Steemit is a social network where what happens is if you want to go onto the social network, uh, you can now uh, vote and you can do all sorts of things, like things, and you can earn cryptocurrency and so on. Um, I don't need to use Facebook anymore. Okay, so what is Facebook going to do in terms of how it monetizes its business, you know, in terms of advertising? So these are things that you should be thinking about, and this is definitely something that uh, uh, is, is here. It's not even coming. I'm not even giving you a warning about what's in the future. It's here already today. It's just a matter of these types of businesses becoming uh, uh, you know, more visible and uh, more widespread and people getting into this idea of cryptocurrency. And you can be sure that with Bitcoin over $10,000 right now that more and more people are becoming interested in it. You know, the price uh, you know, is definitely a, a, has a function on, on its, its, uh, its um, uh, visibility and, and uh, popularity. So more and more people are becoming aware of these cryptocurrencies. And as they become more aware of these cryptocurrencies, they're going to be more likely to use these sorts of services. All right, Filecoin, by the way, uh, is storage. Um, you know, and right now, if you want to get storage on, on, on a cloud storage, you know, you'll use Dropbox or Google Drive. I use Google Drive. But uh, uh, one of the things that Filecoin does is that, you know, we all have uh, uh, laptops and computers out there, and there's a little bit of hard drive space that we're not using. Imagine if you could now go and rent your little bit of hard drive space to thousands of people, and they could pay you with these microtransactions using cryptocurrency. Well, now I don't need Google Drive or, Google or Dropbox. Okay, so can you see how, uh, uh, again, it always comes down to the peer-to-peer -peer payment. If you can make a peer-to-peer -peer microtransaction without using a bank, really is going to create a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, disruptions in terms of how businesses operate and also how you guys uh, operate as well. Okay, so uh, can, let's just uh, focus on that now because I, I don't want to just leave you at the, with that. I want to say, look, there are opportunities for the banks. Now, one of the most important things about uh, money is how safe it is. You know, why do we use banks? Because, you know, banks perform this function of providing a safe environment to store our money and a safe transaction environment. Well, right now, one of the biggest issues with these cryptocurrencies is that people lose their uh, money. You know, they lose their keys and it becomes complicated. And uh, what's my password? Oh, my goodness, I just lost 10 bitcoins. I mean, that goes on and on. There's so many times that's happened. Uh, really, I, I got a call yesterday from my brother-in-law whose friend forgot his password and lost three bitcoins. So I, I said, I can't help you. But if you guys were keeping these bitcoins for him, then you could come in and reset his password or you could provide some kind of service. So maybe as a, a digital bank of the future, you guys can do that as a service you know, pr provide a safe environment for people to store these currencies. Because if they're going to be using it as currency, it's not enough that I'm going to download some app from some strange p company that I've never heard of and hope that they look after my money. I'd rather have a, a bank uh, look after that for me. Okay. Um, another interesting thing, so I'm going to talk more about these interesting things when it comes to this global banking system, the ability to make global payments. And this uh, comes down to a tech that I, I created a few years ago. I was working in the energy industry. Um, what happened was I uh, uh, allowed uh, smart meters, uh, smart electrical meters to accept Bitcoin as payment. So that means you could be anywhere in the world and uh, accept Bitcoin uh, and, and buy electricity on a meter. So this is something that I created. And um, uh, the use cases for that at the time were things like, well, maybe your student's studying abroad and you want to, uh, you know, you need electricity uh, and you, what you'll do is you phone your mom and say, mom, please send me money. I need to, you know, top up my meter. She'll remit money. It'll cost a lot. It'll take a few days. Well, with Bitcoin, she can just go and send a few uh, rands worth of Bitcoins directly to the meter and buy electricity. And then another use case was, um, uh, and this is one, th one thing that I actually created a pilot for, was uh, uh, foreign donors. You know, if you now uh, send money uh, to a charity, if you want to go and uh, fund a cause you believe in, you've got to go and trust an, um, an intermediary. You've got to trust a charity organization. And charity organizations, what they do is they go and uh, opaquely distribute the funds. You know, they uh, have costs, they have admin costs, they, you know, spend it on what they think they should spend it on. And also sometimes, you know, uh, there is a bit of corruption there. Money gets uh, leaked out uh, in this leaky bucket. So uh, what we created was this ability for a school here uh, down in Soweto, in any primary school, to accept Bitcoin uh, from foreign donors. So you could now directly fund the energy of that school without having to go through a, a, an intermediary. By directly topping up that meter with electricity, you knew exactly where your money was going uh, at very low cost and, and, and instantly you could do that. So you can see how uh, this ability to, to move money in this way really does create a lot of opportunities in terms of aid as well. You know, aid is a big deal. There's a lot of aid that goes out there and most of it leaks out, in, out of the bucket. 
you know, there's this leaky bucket. Um, and now what we can do is we can now go and uh, reach what's called the long tail of charity. Uh, long tail uh, it, it was this idea, there's a book by Chris Anderson, and he says there's, in products there's always, or services, there's a long tail. You get a few products or services that are very popular and have most of the population, most of the market, like Facebook, for example. And then down the line, you get uh, less well-known services that a fewer and fewer people uh, uh, have access to. Well, when it comes to charity, it's the same sort of thing. You know, there's major big charity organizations and there, you know, a few of them out there and they get most of the money. And there's a lot of little causes out there that just can't be reached because the finance, you know, you want to pay five rand to some cause, let's say. It's impossible for you to do that. But using a cryptocurrency, you can now reach that long tail. You can really literally fund five rand on some little thing down the line of that tail that might make a difference to somebody's life. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, end off on this one because I wanted to talk about uh, uh, what, uh, what I'm doing with Centbee. Is that uh, one day you're going to, in the snap scan type model, is, uh, this is what we are, are producing right now. You're going to be able to buy your groceries and all that sort of thing. And obviously, um, uh, um, you know, we're going to tie in with the bank and hopefully you guys can uh, support us on that. In fact, we do have a bank with FNB, our business bank account. Um, uh, so we have uh, th this type of product with payments. And also we have these vouchers, these Bitcoin vouchers so people can buy, uh, go and buy Bitcoin. Okay, so let me now end off on the Bitcoin thing, because I alluded to the fact that I don't think Bitcoin in the way it is today is going to last forever. Now, as a Bitcoin, what's called maximalist, you know, I always used to say things like, one day, you know, if somebody would say, listen, okay, Bitcoin is cool, but what about other currencies? What if the currency comes along that's better than Bitcoin? Okay, and I, always, I would always say things like, no, it's never going to happen, you know, because if something comes along that's better than Bitcoin, you know, it's software, Bitcoin will just upgrade. The community will never allow Bitcoin to become a lesser coin or a lesser cryptocurrency that, that you know, people move away from. That was kind of my belief. That's what I used to say to people. But over the last few years, what we've noticed is that the, the maintainers of Bitcoin, because there is a community maintaining Bitcoin, they have been, become fixated on this one path of being able to scale Bitcoin. Because right now, Bitcoin has a huge problem. As more and more people get into it, the volumes pick up, and Bitcoin has this, this cap on how many transactions per second. And uh, what happens now is the fees are becoming enormous with Bitcoin. If you want to send money with Bitcoin today, sometimes you're going to pay 50 Rand, 100 Rand, just to move a little bit of Bitcoin. So to me, Bitcoin is starting to show uh, uh, the kind of thing that I never thought would happen, where it's becoming so resistant to change that it's actually going to potentially fail. Now, in, on August the 1st, what happened was the, the uh, uh, a community decided to split Bitcoin or fork it away. It's called fork it away and go back to the way Bitcoin was created initially, where what we have is we don't have this artificial supply and how many transactions per second. And that, by the way, is related directly to the block size. Remember I said transactions come every 10 minutes and are grouped into a block. Well, that block has a limit of how many transactions. Well, what happened on August the 1st is that this was created, Bitcoin Cash. And Bitcoin Cash said, whoa, 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 we don't like what Bitcoin is doing right now. We don't like the fact that they're trying to create new technology to scale Bitcoin, which is unproven and potentially might fail. What we're going to do is we're just going to keep Bitcoin the way it is, the way it was originally devised, and we're just going to increase the size of the blocks. Now, you'll be amazed that that is such an issue, but it has created the split in the community. And right now, Bitcoin Cash, in my mind, is probably going to become the dominant Bitcoin in the future. So this is not investment advice or anything like that, but uh, it happened. It happened where Bitcoin, it did in fact become something that didn't keep up with innovation. And I do believe that Bitcoin Cash is going to be uh, the coin that is going to have the most uh, value in, in the future because especially of its low fees and its speed of transactions. The fact that I can now make a one rand payment with Bitcoin Cash. Making a one rand payment with Bitcoin is going to cost me 50 or 100 rand to do, which is insane. And that's not, probably not going to change uh, for a long time. So I wanted to bring this up because it's something I feel strongly about. And as people like yourselves, you might even be thinking about investing in Bitcoin. Sure, the price of Bitcoin is 10,000, 11,000. It's probably going to 15, 20, who knows. But as far as the long-term potential for these two currencies, if you have to make the decision, technically and fundamentally and economically, I do believe that Bitcoin Cash is going to become you know, a, a, a superior coin. And I wanted to just put that in there because it has become political and, and quite complicated. Um, and I hope that that can answer some questions for you. Okay, this is just a picture of, of kind of the, the fork that happened over there. It's not uh, really any more information. But what I'm going to do, I think, is I'm going to end it on that. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, I see my thing is dying, so now is a good time to end. Um, 
if they would have any questions, if you would like to ask me anything about what I've just said, uh, please go ahead. But thank you very much for your time and thank you for listening.